The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, ready? Uh, so, let me recap the important lecture from last time that gave the framework that we'll see in Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 really a major part of the course. And our example was a line of masses and springs. So that's the, like the first example to start with. And you remember there were three steps. Uh, if we want to know how much the masses displace, we have to get to the springs. D difference in displacement gave the stretching of the springs. Then comes the material law, Hooke's law in this case, with a matrix C uh, that led to CAU. And then finally, those spring forces are balanced by the external forces that brought in a transpose. So that's the, the picture to look for. And, and uh, I just mention it again because uh, it's so central. Um, and uh, so we'll be doing other examples of that, but I wanted to stay with springs and masses for today for, to do another type of problem, a problem in which time enters, a problem in which we're not looking for the steady state, but it's Newton's law is going to come in. Th this is actually Newton's law. You recognize mass, you recognize acceleration, and the force on the spring is minus, is minus KU. So when minus KU, when the force came over to that side, that, that's the equation we're looking at. So, so it's like time out for a discussion of the very important subject of time derivatives. How do I solve initial value problems now? Uh, so I start from, so I have some starting time u, u I'm, I'm given u of zero, the starting position of the springs, and I'm given the velocity at zero. So I'm given two facts at zero. That's, that's very different from uh, the steady state problem where you're given stuff around the boundary. Here we're given stuff at the start, initial values instead of boundary values. So what does this mean? It means that I, maybe I pull the springs down and I let go. And what do they do? They oscillate. And you will have studied this equation. I hope you've seen that equation because I think of it as the fundamental equation of mechanics. In fact, I've even used those words, the fundamental equation of mechanical engineering. Well, it's Newton's law for, uh, for a system. So the matrix M now has several, two masses. In this case, it would be a two by two system. The matrix M would have two masses. Suppose the mass, mass one may be like nine and mass two is one. So this, copying what our problem is, we'd have a nine and a one multiplying U1 double prime and U2 double prime. Can I use prime for a derivative rather than dots? Because I'm never too sure if the dots is there or not. So I, prime I can see. Now, and then plus our KU, and actually you know what K will look like uh, for this system. Uh, it's fixed, fixed. Uh, I, well, let me write down what K would would look like, just because we saw it at the very end, what it looks like if there are spring constants, C1, C2, and C3. Can I rem rem just remind you what that will look like? What the, the K, so this will multiply U and give zero. So the mass matrix is diagonal in, in the problem. That, that's diagonal matrices we certainly expect to be easy almost as easy as the identity matrix where we would have two equal masses. Here it's just that little bit more general with two different masses. And in here, 
the kind of thing that we created just at the end of the last lecture was something like C1 plus C2 on the diagonal and a minus C2 and a minus C2 and a C2 plus C3. So C2 for the middle spring is, is the one that's really there with its full little element matrix C2 minus C2 minus C2 C2. The C1 part is only coming in at the top because it's connected to a fixed support and C3 is only coming in at the bottom. Anyway, that's the matrix K. This is the matrix M and how do we solve the problem? Okay. You've, you've seen before and now Adina, Professor Bata's code or any other code would offer like two different ways. One way is because we have constant coefficients here, we can expect f a, a pretty clean formula for the answer. And because we're growing, well, we're oscillating in time, things are happening in time, we expect eigenvectors, eigenvalues to come in into that formula. I think it's worth just repeating that formula. H how do you approach it? And then the second, the really serious issue is how do you, how do you solve equation like this or even more general time dependent problems? I mean, this is what finite element codes are created for. How do you study the crash of a car? So what, what's, so this isn't quite the equation for a car crash. Uh, what would be different in a car crash? Because this is what, um, there's a short uh, section in a later in chapter two called the reality of computational engineering. And the reality is cars crash, people drop their cell phones, and those are very difficult problems to, to, to compute with and of course quite absolutely impossible to use eigenvectors because they, well, they're not linear at all, right? If you, if you crash two cars, you know, if you want to study, everything's happening in a, like a hundredth of a second or something. But uh, what's happening there is highly nonlinear, so it's very much more complicated. M m you take thousands of time steps maybe within the, the crash time and you're going to use finite differences or finite elements. So, and, and, and th th so this is a chance to, to say something about this special equation for uh, finite difference methods. Yeah, yeah, it's really 18086 that takes up these questions seriously. If I choose a finite difference method, see the thing is, with finite differences, you've got m many, many choices. You know, if, if there's only one way to go in step one. You know, eigenvectors, these, this thing has got eigenvectors, go, you find them, you're in. But for the much more general, typical problems that you'll be solving the rest of your lives, <coughs> uh, finite differences or finite elements, you've got lots of choices. And, and they, the issues that come up are the accuracy of the choice. You know, uh, centered differences is often gives you that extra order of accuracy. Stability is something we have not seen yet because, so what does stability mean? Stability means that as I follow my difference equation forward in time, it stays near the true equation. You, you'll see by example. So some methods are more stable than others. Some are completely unstable and unusable. And then of course the other condition, another desired uh, uh, requirement is speed of calculation. So these balance each other. It's a, it's a beautiful subject and, and uh, let me just open the door to that subject today if I can. Okay, may I start with the eigenvector solution? Okay, how would I solve this equation by eigenvectors? Okay, well again, I'm going to look for a special solution. So this is, so let me write that equation down again. MU double prime plus KU equals zero. I, I'm, I'm taking zero external force. So the, the uh, springs and masses are just oscillating. 
their total energy won't change. It's a closed system. The kinetic plus the potential energy will stay constant, and we can show why. Uh, there, there's a lot in this section, by the way, section 2.2, more, more than I'll be able to do in the lecture. But let me capture the key idea. So one key idea is the natural idea when we have constant coefficients. Uh, look, for, uh, look, for, look for special solutions. So look for, so let me say look for special solutions of the form. Well, let's keep in mind always the simplest model of all. Let me put it over here because I'll focus on it especially. The simplest case would be u double prime with a mass normalized to 1 <laughs> plus u equals 0. Just a single equation. So that's just a single spring. Da, 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 da. That single mass. So the mass is just oscillating up and down, and we all know that it's going to oscillate up and down. Uh, sines and cosines are going to come into here. In fact, we know that the solution to that would be this could have uh, cosine, this would have some cosine t's and some, some u could be a combination of cos t and sine t, right? And the a and b would be used to match the initial, the two initial conditions. So that's what we've got in the scalar case. This is one spring. One, n is one. We don't have a matrix here, just a number. Okay, but that will, that's our guide to the matrix case. So now what am I going to look for? I'm going to look for u of t. I'll look for special solutions of the form now, cos. Now, I, they'll go at different frequencies, so the frequency is, is to be found. So that's, that's the time dependence. And then some, if, if I'm lucky, all the springs will be going together. So, so this x, am I going to use x for eigenvector? I think so. Yeah, let's use x for eigenvector as well. Okay, so this is a vector. This is a constant vector. And this gives the oscillation. Okay, and that's a, this is a, let me just already start with that. What would be, so I'm looking for, I'm look, I've got two unknowns here, right? Two things that I'm free to choose. I'm free to choose the frequency omega, and I'm free to choose this vector x. And I've like separated out time. The way we've been doing it with an e to the lambda t, we used an e to the lambda t, this, that was sort of right for a first order equation. Cosine is right for a second order equation like this. Okay. When is that a solution to my equation? May I just plug it in? M, so I'm going to just plug it in, plug in. I know. S substitute's a better word than plug in, right? So, so, so I just plug it in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I get uh, M times that second derivative. So the second derivative of the cosine is the cosine with a minus m omega squared, is that right? Yes? Times what? So that, that's what came from the time derivative, times cos, times this cos omega t x, right? So I, two time derivatives brought down a minus omega squared. And the other part is just k times u, cos omega t x. And that should be zero. Okay, so when, and this, should, this is supposed to be a good solution that works for all time, so I'll, f I'll d this is what I want to be zero. I want, do, do you see what's left? Kx um, from the here, and uh, putting it on the other side, m omega squared x. Kx is, can I write the omega squared that way? Omega squared mx. 
then I'm, if, if, that, if that is satisfied, then the differential equation is satisfied. I've got a solution. So I'm looking for k and I'm looking for x and omega. And by the way, I could also have sine omega t here, as, as well as cosine, just the way over there. Sines and cosines both possible. So sine omega t x. Say it would be exactly the same, except that it would be a sine omega t that I'd be dividing out. And again, I'd come back to this. This is the key promise. And do you see that somehow here we have an eigenvector x and an eigenvalue omega squared? An eigenvalue omega squared, right. And, but there is one little twist. It's not quite our standard eigenvalue problem. What's the, what's, the, what's the extra guy that's present in that box that we don't usually see? M. M is the new person there, new, new thing. The mass matrix, which if all masses were one, the mass matrix would be the identity. We would be back, we would just have our standard problem. I just have to say a word about the case when the, when the mass matrix is there. Uh, it's, it's still an eigenvalue problem. I, I, if you like, I can bring M inverse over here. I, can, I, could, I could write it as M inverse K X equal omega squared X. So I'm looking for, I'm looking for the eigenvalues of M inverse K. That's really what I'm doing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of m inverse k. But I'm always trying to be like aesthetically right. And, and what's m inverse k has a, has just a little something wrong with it, which is it's not symmetric. If I, if I take my matrix k, which is beautifully symmetric, and my M, which is beautifully symmetric, but when I do M inverse K, do you see what will happen? The inverse of that matrix will have a one-ninth. That, when I do M inverse K, that row will get divided by nine, and the second row won't change because I got a one. So it just, like, spoiled things a little. It, 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 you can deal with it. But actually, it, in some way, it's better to keep it right. And MATLAB is, Totally okay with that. So, so Mat MATLAB would use the command eig and, and other systems too of k comma m. It just tell MATLAB the two matrices. Then it solves that problem. It will print out the, well, as if you just typed eig, it would print out the eigenvalues. If you Ask it for the eigenvector matrix, it'll print those two. So it, it, that has the grand name generalized eigenvalue problem. Generalized because it's got an M in there. I, I don't know if you've met these problems wh where there could be an M. It, it's just a natural and it's not really a big deal. Particularly when M is a positive diagonal matrix, it's not a big deal at all. It's, it, it, <coughs> The same codes is essentially finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so suppose we have them. We expect n positive eigenvalues, and those will be the omega squareds, and each one comes with its eigenvector, and uh, Complete set, e everything is good. We're, we're, we're talking about symmetric positive definite matrices. Notice that K is positive definite. That's been, that was what our whole last weeks have been about. And M is obviously positive definite. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a complete, uh, per it's a perfect setup for the eigenvalue problem. I, I just want to think the, through the final step. After we find the eigenvalues, lambda, the omega squareds, then we know the omegas, and we find the eigenvectors, x, how do you write the answer? So what have I done so far? 
I've looked for some special solution. And I will find them. So I've, I've, I've found these omegas. They can go with sines or cosines. I found the x's. Now, how do I, what's the general solution? Yeah, what, what, if, I, if I have these solutions to my great equation there, what's the general solution? U of t. So this would be the, the, the big picture. What can I do in linear equations? Well, linear combinations. That's, that's what linear algebra is all about, linear combinations. So I could take a linear combination of these cosines, so cosine of omega 1 t x 1. So that would be a solution coming from the first eigenvector and the eigenvalue, or the square root, times any constant. And then, of course, I could have a b1. I use b's for the sines, omega 1 t x 1. So that's just like that, but it's used the sines, which would also solve the equation. And then uh, all the way down to xn's, right? So I've got two n, two n simple solutions. N cosines times eigenvectors, and N sines times those same eigenvectors. Wh why do I want two N? Why do I, so I've got two N constants then to choose, the A's and the B's. And how do I choose them? What, what's, the, what's the next step? So, so uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, using eigenvectors, maybe I just, mention again the three steps because that's uh, the, 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 th the three step rule, the three step method. Step one, find A's and B's from, oh now, now you have to answer my question. Where, do they, where are the A's and B's going to come from? What's going to determine these, these two N constants, the A's and the B's? The initial conditions, of course. We've got two initial conditions. This is a vector. We're, we're talking about a system here. I've got position of, of, of both masses. I've got the initial velocity of both masses. And the A's come from the A's, they come from, the, because they go, they're going to, the A's go with the cosines, and so they're going to be the ones associated with U of zero will give this, will give a combination, will, will give the A's, U of zero will be A1X1 plus ANXN, this is at t equals zero. So I'm using the initial conditions. U of zero is a combination of those eigenvectors and the b's. So this is from the initial conditions. And the b's, of course, are going to come from u prime of zero, the initial velocity, because they go with sines. So sines start at zero, but they have an initial uh, velocity. OK. So that's step one. That is that finds the constants, it, it splits the problem into these normal modes. It finds how much of each eigenvector is in there at the start. Step two, so it's, it's really worth seeing these three steps because they just repeat and repeat for all applications of eigenvalues. Step two is what? Step two is follow each of these guys forward in time. Follow them to some, to any time. What does that mean? That means just put in the cosines and the sines. So, so the A's, the A's go to, the A's go to A times cosine omega t. So I'm just saying what happens to those coefficients, each, each one, let's see. A sub i, say, goes to ai is multiplied by the cosine. 
and the b's, b i's go to b i sine omega, sine of omega i t. So now we've got, we've we followed the coefficients forward in time, and step three, the final step, is, so here we're following each one, so it, 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 the, the pattern is always the same one. Take your starting, starting uh, conditions, split them up into eigenvectors, follow each eigenvector, and then step three is reassemble, put them back together. Step three is, step three is the solution, u at that later time t is a1 cos omega 1 t x1 and b1 sine omega 1 t x1. Those are the two guys that are, that come, that are the, reflecting the, the fundamental mode. And then we have a2s and b2s multiplied by cosines and sines and times x2 and so on. Put, put the pieces together. So it's split the initial conditions, follow each eigenvector, reassemble. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the heart of Fourier methods, it's, it's the heart of using eigenvectors. Okay, and there's a little code uh, in the book that uh, does exactly that. So let's just pause a moment. This was the eigenvector solution. And now I want to talk about computational science, which is, for which this problem is a model, but the problem has probably got more complications and things change in time, whatever. There's a, uh, we don't, this was an exact solution. That, that's more than we hope for in, a, in, in a real computations. We hope for accuracy, but we don't hope for 100% accuracy unless we have this exact model problem. So, uh, so we use finite differences. Ready for finite differences? Okay, so th that's, this is method one which allows you to understand the model problem. And now comes method two, which allows you to compute much more, much more, many more problems. Okay, and, and if I do it just for this, let me come back to just this model. One, one spring and one mass. Okay, what's the, let, let's start that mass, uh, shall we start the mass at rest? Let, let me take the, the the solution, the initial conditions that, uh, let me make that the, so the answer. I want that to be the answer, so I'm going to start with u of zero to be zero, uh, to be one, right? I'm going to start with u of zero to be one and u prime of zero to be zero. Because the cosine starts at one and its derivative starts at zero. So all I'm doing, what am I doing? Um, apologies that this is such a simple model. Uh, I'm just pulling this spring down, uh, this uh, mass down and let go. I just pull it down at amount one. I let go, it oscillates forever. If I, if I draw the, the, how, yeah, how, how do I, how do I draw the motion of a, of a single mass? It's, it's, uh, a picture is important and, and we have to think, okay, what's in the picture? So I think the picture should be maybe uh, u, of u in this direction and maybe u prime in this direction. So it's the u, u prime plane, the, the, the position velocity plane, sometimes called the phase plane. I'll just write that word down, phase plane. And, and what will be our picture here? It starts there, right? U of zero is one, no velocity starts there. Oh, and then it just follows cosine t, and of course I know what u prime is. If u is cosine t, 
u prime is minus sine t. So, yeah, let me put that somewhere I, where my picture won't run over it up here maybe. u prime is minus sine t. Tell me what, yeah, help me out. What, if I, if, as time increases, I, I follow this point. The x coordinate is cos t. The y coordinate is minus sine t. It's a circle. It's a circle. So I just buzz along. It's because of that minus sine, the circle goes this way around. It's a unit circle. Goes on forever. And, and actually, cos squared plus sine squared is 1. Of course, that's why it's a circle of radius 1. And that represents the total energy, actually, or uh, uh, the, t the energy. I, I, I'm trying to draw a circle. Actually, how would you, how do you, how would you get your computer to draw uh, a circle? I'm, I'm thinking not just one circle. I want to I refresh it. I mean, I want to follow this in time. So I want to draw, uh, I want to follow a point around a circle. Okay. Well, I suppose what you would do would be to ask it to plot those points. That's not allowed. I want you to f follow the solution to the equation. I want, to, I want to take that equation whose exact solution is a circle, and I want to t use finite differences in time, so I'm going to take finite steps. Of course, that's what the computer has to do. The computer will, will take finite steps. So I would I'd be very happy if those finite steps keep me on the circle. And I'd be even happier if it came around exactly right at 2 pi, but it, it's not going to. You, you see, so I, yeah, how, how do I, I, I want finite differences. I want to replace that differential equation by finite differences. And when we do this equation, we're practically doing that one at the same time. Yeah, so th this model will be fine. Okay. Uh, what, let's see. So I, I want to introduce finite differences for this equation. And everybody, we've been talking about how to replace second derivatives by second differences. Yeah, so that would be, that looks good. Uh, yeah, I, okay, let me, let me write down, maybe I could write down three or four possible finite differences. For, for you double prime, I, I, I think I'll write down u n plus 1 minus 2 u n plus u n minus 1. That's the second difference that replaces the second derivative divided by what? What do you think goes in the denominator now? As we're square, of square of what? Yeah, now what's the, what's the right name? If it's going to be something squared, what do I put down there? The step size, I don't want to call it delta x, right? What should I call it? Delta t would be natural, delta t. Or, or h, I could again use h just to have a shorthand. Okay, that's my, that's my second difference. It's centered, it's the natural choice. And not the only choice, by the way. Oh, if I'm, yeah, if I'm an astronomer, or like Professor Wisdom here. So he, he followed the, or uh, he followed Pluto around, right? And discovered that Pluto wasn't a planet, right? He discovered that the motion of Pluto was not like regular, like the Earth. I think the Earth is regular, but Pluto has chaotic motion. So it does crazy stuff. Right, okay. Well, our, we, we're looking for very periodic circular motion here. Okay, so uh, w w what I was going to say, Professor Wisdom, he, he would sneer at this second differences, right? I mean, as we'll see, that's got decent accuracy, but not accuracy that would f allow you to follow Pluto for, for 100, 100 million years. So, but it'll do for us. We're not going 100 million years here. Okay. So now comes minus u. 
Now, question. Right? Uh, I'm taking this, the, the U term, and I'm putting it on the other side. So this is mass is 1, acceleration is this, the force is minus U. Now it comes the big question, do I do, do I compute the, do I, do I use, for minus U, do I use the newest value? Do I use the middle value or do I use the oldest value? Or some combination. Yeah, if I want high accuracy, oh, then I go way up in these differences and I go, I find tricky combinations that get, get me above uh, first and second order accuracy, but let's not go there. So I, I've got to make one of those choices. Okay. And that choice is going to decide, so that's, I mean, this is a choice you have to make when you have such a problem. Where, where are you going to evaluate this? Okay. I guess one choice, one choice jumps out as natural. What, what would you think of doing? I mean, if you, if you would do, you would do, well, how, how many would do that one? So those are people, that's the conservative choice. Stable. You kind of, yeah, it's the, uh, uh, but the, uh, and then how many would do this? Yeah, you would do that, right. Okay, I would call that the leapfrog choice. Somehow this, this uh, second difference is leaping over this middle point, so that would be the leapfrog method. And then if I use a, um, a very uh, low, yeah, yeah uh, uh, to, to use the first value would be, okay. So my point is those are three different choices. And each one has these questions of accuracy. The middle one will be more accurate because it's centered. E each one has a question of stability. Ah, you don't see stability yet. But so that's my, the point of my, the rest of the lecture is to see what is this stability question. Now, uh, the issue of speed Speed would be, um, this is the slow one, because it involves, I, I have to bring un plus 1 over there. I, and if, if I've got a system of equations, then, then I, it, it would take me some time. This is, this is called, this would be called impl an implicit method. It, the new un plus 1 is only given imp implicitly because it's showing up on the right-hand side. I've got to move it over to the left. If it's nonlinear, I've got a system to solve. It's safer, but more expensive. And then, but this would be the natural choice. Okay. Now, yeah, I'm wondering how to, I want to get eigenvalues and eigenva eigenvalues into, into this picture. Uh, so I'm going to do the step we often do when we see a second order equation, that is reduce it to two first order equations. Can I do that and, and see the same thing? So what, are, what would be my two first order equations? My unknowns will be u and u prime, so it'll be first order, the derivative of u and U prime, shall I call it V for velocity? Yeah, let me, let me write down, I don't need to write this fancy. The, the two equations will be U prime is V, and V prime is what? So U prime equal V sort of told me what V was. V is the velocity, the, derivative, the time derivative of du dt. And now the derivative of the velocity, now that should reflect my true equation. So th this is all coming from u double prime plus u equals zero. Okay? So v prime is what? V prime is u double prime. Do I want minus u there? Yeah, that, that's my equation. v prime, which is u double prime, is minus u. Good. That's my, that's my system. So I have a matrix here. Yeah, I, I have a two by two system with a matrix 0, 1, minus 1, 0, I guess. Okay. So while thinking about difference methods, so this 
I was thinking about a second order equation, I went right to it. Here I'm thinking about a first order system. A lot of problems come in first order systems. Gas dynamics comes as a big first order system for, you know, those components of mass, momentum, energy, uh, typically five uh, nonlinear equations in gas dynamics. I mean, that's a very, very serious problem, how to solve those. Uh, here we've got a very sim much simpler model problem, linear constant coefficient. But what do we do? Okay. Let me, can I propose three possibilities here, and actually they are identical to these three possibilities, if I, if, if, if I just switch over to a first order system. So possibility one, if I have a, uh, uh, possibility one is that u n plus one and v n plus one, so that u n plus one would be, uh, uh, how do I model that equation? u n plus one is u n plus delta t v n. That would be a natural, right? Uh, yeah, let me just pause there because that's the, that's meant to be the natural uh, forward difference. So I replaced u prime by u n plus one minus u n over delta t, and I replaced v by what I the value I know. And do you know whose name is associated with that? So it's just I'm almost going to say his name. Um, it's just I replace a, a differential equation by a difference equation where I each step I just could figure out what the slope is, and I go along a straight line, delta t further along, and it, it, do you know his name? Euler, Euler, right. It's Euler's method, the very first method you would think of, right? Uh, so, so here I, I have, so, uh, and I'm doing the same for v. I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at an old, this is my position I've reached, and my, so, uh, Euler's method is replace this by Vn plus 1 minus Vn over delta t equals minus Un. So this is Euler's idea. Predict the new value by a forward difference starting from the, uh, where the slope of the line is this old one. That, that's the most, that's the first difference method you would think of. So now if I multiply up by delta t, I have a minus delta t v u n. Okay. Good, good time to pay attention. Here, this is Euler's, this is forward Euler. Forward Euler. Just the, 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 the time step, you, you follow the derivative, what the derivative is at the start of the step. You follow it for a little step. Oh, let me draw what the, what the thing would do. Shall I draw what fo forward Euler will do? So, so we're here, and what's our first step? Our first step, so we're starting at v is zero at the start, so u won't change in one step. But u is 1, so v will go down. I think the first step will take us there. That, th this was, this, that point was 1, 0. And I think the second step, u came from the 0, so it'll still be a 1. And v came from a 0, but minus delta, I think it'll just be 1 minus delta t. It's left the circle, of course. Uh, and what do you think happens when I do a, a thousand steps? If you, 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 I mean, MATLAB, this is two lines in MATLAB. Just, just write those equations for the next u coming from the previous u starting at one zero and see what happens. 
And, and what do you think? It's going to sort of go round. I mean, it's a reason Euler wasn't dumb. Anything true here is the fact that Euler was not dumb. Uh, he had a bunch of ideas. This wasn't his greatest. Uh, uh, but it was the first, it was the starting point of any, you know, if you have to code some complicated problem, start with Euler, forward Euler. Okay, what'll happen? It'll spiral out. Exactly. It'll spiral out. And if I was an eigenvalue person, and I guess, which I probably am, I would look at the eigen, I would look at this, I would look at the, uh, there's some matrix here that's finding the new UV from the old UV. Maybe we can even find out right above what that matrix is. If I had to say where did the, the new UV comes from the old UV, well, I, there's the identity matrix. Here's a delta T and here's a minus delta T. That would be my matrix. That's the forward Euler matrix. The growth matrix for forward Euler is that. Now, what do you think about its eigenvalues before? Just spiral out was the right answer. Spiral, you know, it's, it's I mean, it's, if delta T is small, it'll stay close to the circle, but it'll get, it'll spiral out from it. So if uh, we were following a planet, it would, you know, it would just be off. Okay, what, so I can't immediately, well, you could almost see the eigenvalues of this matrix. What's the determinant of that matrix? What's the determinant of G? I'm just asking you to think through, you see a matrix like this, you wonder about its eigenvalues, so you take the determinant and what do you get? One, something bigger than one or less than one? Bigger. bigger. So that tells me what? Since the determinant is the product of lambda one times lambda two, whatever those guys are, at least one of those eigenvalues is bigger than one. This has an eigenvalue. Actually, the actual eigenvalues of this happen to be one from the identity matrix, and then this guy is what we, was our example of an imaginary eigenvalue, I delta T. Bigger than one in, in, in absolute value. For, it's, it goes out. Okay, so that's forward Euler, corresponding to that choice. Okay, can I change to a second to Euler's other choice? And you, you can guess what its name is. Instead of forward Euler, it's going to be backward Euler. Euler said, if you don't like it, you know, I've got another one. And what will happen then? Backward Euler is going to use, instead of the old value, it will use the new values here. So these differences you see that this is now a, you see that this is a backward difference? So I'm at time n plus one, I'm at the new time, and this goes back from that. So this is at the new time, and this is a difference backward. And what happens now? Well, we could follow backward Euler, we could follow its first step. What would its first step be? Un plus u1. This is, is this, no, I can't follow its first step so easily. Help me out by just making a guess. W what do you think backward Euler does? If it spirals in, right, right. The cover of the book has forward Euler, I think, is on the cover of the textbook, spiraling out in the front. But maybe, maybe the back cover also has backward Euler spiraling in. So here's backward Euler, and after I take, you know, a bunch of steps, it comes back somewhere there, but it's spiraled in. No good. Have we got one minute for the good method? You're, you're guessing that it's this one? And uh, so what, how does that work? Actually, it's pretty neat. 
I, I, here, here's, here, so my question is where, where do I evaluate these guys? Okay, so this is like forward and backward. The, the U equation, so, so I know UN and VN, right? I've, everybody with me? I've got to time in. I know UN and VN, the position and velocity approximately at point N, and I want to go to N plus 1. Okay, so if I go, what I know is VN, so that's great. But what's going to change here? Now I know un plus 1 from the first equation. What shall I do? Where shall I evaluate u in the second equation? At n plus 1. Why not? I know it already. From, from the first step, from the forward step, with this equation, I've taken u forward. So I'll use that forward value of u in the V equation. So it's forward and backward at the same time. And uh, the net result, if I, simply, if I go back from my system of two first order equations back to one second order equation, I'll find the centered guy. And what do you think happens with that centered difference? Oh, well, okay, that's, you know, I, I think MATLAB would have to show it. Ma uh, and it, it, look in section 2.2 for the picture that shows the leapfrog method. So what, what do you think? I, I, I'm, I'm having to depend on my memory now, and, and I'm, um, uh, it, it stays, almost on the circle. I think it maybe, it, it stays very close to the circle and uh, comes back almost at the right time, but not exactly. Because we have an error here. You know, we, we haven't got the real equation, we've got a difference equation. But, uh, so maybe that's, th that's the point to say. When you start with a differential equation, you've got various choices. Um, Backward is actually safer, probably for a car crash. Uh, no, actually, I think for a car crash they would use forward differences because they have to take so many. I'm, I'm not, uh, let me check on that. But for our problem, this, this one is, the leapfrog is the winner. Actually, if anybody does computation in computational chemistry, I mean, that's a subject that uses giant supercomputers to follow uh, molecular dynamics, to follow what, um, what molecules are doing at high speed, very high speed. So this, there's a giant number multiplying that u, and they, they use a, a leapfrog method. Okay, I, I'll say a little more Friday if I can about this general subject because it's so important.